Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, David Petraeus was, of course, um, the commander of the US-led uh, coalition forces in both Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as um, the commander of CENTCOM, and therefore uh, pretty much the most uh, senior and experienced American general uh, alive today. He's also an intellectual soldier. And I think this is a very important aspect of him that I'm going to ask him about uh, later in this interview, in that he um, graduated in the top 5% of the US uh, Military Academy. Um, he was the top graduate in the Staff College. He was a, uh, is a PhD from Princeton and a Fellow of International Relations at Georgetown. So we're not just talking about a soldier, we're talking about somebody of genuine intellectual heft, uh, as I'm, I'm sure we're going to uh, discover later on um, this afternoon. My first question, though, not, not is... the heft a... of your books, I might add. <laughs> you know. um, Congratulations on George III. That's very uh, kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant oh, very kind biography. Of right. Um, the first um, question I'd like to ask, though, isn't really about intellect. It's about your, your upbringing, your family. Your father was a Liberty ship captain. Uh, Tell us about that, about sure. where you get your drive from, and also why uh, you joined the Army. Well, uh, I was born and raised 50 miles north of New York, uh, pretty close to the Hudson River. Uh, we did a lot of sailing. My dad was a Dutch uh, merchant marine officer, uh, went to the navigation school in Rotterdam. His ship was at sea when the Nazis invaded Holland. They couldn't go home, uh, so they all the boat went up to Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they all signed on with the U.S. Merchant Marine, which was part of the military during the U.S. Uh, effort in World War II, and it had the highest per capita loss rate because the convoys that they were doing in particular to Murmansk were very, very vulnerable uh, to U-boats and also occasionally to battleships. The convoy in which he went as a 29-year-old captain of a Liberty ship uh, lost about half the ships uh, in that particular convoy. So it's pretty hazardous. Uh, you know, Dutch are pretty blunt. Uh, they can be <laughs> stubborn. Uh, my mother used to, what was it, wooden shoes, wooden head, something like that. Um, and, and there's a degree of, again, sheer determination in there as well, I think, as a ship's captain who experienced all that he did during the war. And there's also a bit of a, a results boy attitude. Uh, as in, you know, I'd come home from school and, you know, if things weren't perhaps what they might have been uh, on the grades or something like that, or uh, you know, you have a game that didn't go as well as it might have, and you start to offer a few excuses, uh, he'd sort of look at me and say, results boy. Uh, and there's a lot to that. You know, life is a competitive endeavor. Um, combat is a particularly competitive endeavor, and you don't get a trophy or a t-shirt just for showing up, and he was pretty, pretty clear about that. Um, we, you know, we were good middle class. There was a very um, big emphasis on reading. My mother was a, a librarian uh, part time. House was overrun with books. Uh, for the Dickens lovers in here, we had, I, as I found when my mother passed away, we, we had not one, not two, but three complete collections of Dickens uh, that she had picked up over the years. And so you put all of that together, an appreciation for history uh, and so forth, and and it was a wonderful foundation. And then, of course, I grew up seven miles from West Point. And I think a lot of what we do in life is to be like someone that you admire, you know, that Nike ad, be like Mike. Uh, and in this case, uh, Mike was West Point graduate. So half of my newspaper route for two and a half years when I was a kid uh, were individuals that had graduated from West Point or were teaching at West Point. Our high school soccer coach actually had coached the national championship team. At West Point, he was doing it for a dollar a year in retirement, and we did win this championship our senior year. Um, so it, that's sort of how it all transpired. And then at West Point, I learned this real, I guess it's love for the three aspects of the military, which is there's a physical component, and I was pretty physically oriented. I was on the college soccer and ski teams. Uh, and then there's a leadership component, which is very, very special, a true privilege, of course, to lead others. And, and then there's the academic. And I learned that with a degree of application and focus and that Dutch determination and stubbornness that you, you, know, you could do pretty well. I, I had the ability to do well in all three of those. And, and it then provided a career that had flexibility that was just wonderful. You know, you'd, 
be under a rucksack for eight years and you get a little bit tired of being cold, wet, hungry, <laughs> and so forth, and they send you to graduate school for a couple of years. You get tired of graduate school and studying it and wanting to do it again, and you go do that. I mean, one of the times is per particularly fun. I didn't do the war college. I chose to do a fellowship instead. Uh, and then I did what was called the spring semester abroad, where I actually deployed to Haiti to be the chief of operations for the United Nations Force. Not I was a Blue Beret, not an American in that particular operation, and it was an extraordinary uh, experience uh, in terms of coalition operations, the United Nations, the rules of engagement, and all the rest of this that stood me in very good stead later on. He also um, served in other coalition uh, areas like Bosnia and Yeah, Bosnia Kuwait. was another great example. Uh, and Bosnia was unique in the sense that I was dual-hatted. Uh, I was the one-star general who was in charge of operations for the stabilization force, uh, this was several years into it, it was 2001 to 2002. And then after 9-11, I was also, uh, I had a clandestine hat, literally. I was a deputy commander of a clandestine joint task force called Justice Assured, which was bringing war criminals to The Hague, except we'd been so cautious about it that we'd gotten very, very few. And sec I briefed Secretary Rumsfeld personally. I was the deputy commander of this organization, the three-star U.S. Commander of S-4 was the commander, but he had to do it low-key because obviously NATO commander, they didn't want him, you know, too visibly being connected with that particular effort. Uh, that was a real counterterrorism operation. Uh, we had uh, Delta and SEAL Team 6 that alternated. We had the biggest intelligence gathering uh, operation prior to the deployment to Afghanistan. And interestingly, after 9-11, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld turned us loose on, there was actually a terrorist pipeline that went from Pakistan through Sarajevo and into the Schengen zone, and we discovered it. The intelligence just turned on after 9-11, uh, and we were already in that network because we were a special mission unit under the forward element of Joint Special Operations Command. And so the first counterterrorism operation after 9-11 uh, actually was in Sarajevo, not in, in Afghanistan. It was a tremendous experience for the manhunt component of this, and by the way, you try to detain, not to kill, but you know, in, in the conduct of the surge, for example, one of the important components, in addition to clear hold and build, in addition to reconciliation, because we couldn't kill or capture our way out of an industrial strength insurgency, you did have to go after the irreconcilables. You could not reconcile with them, and these are the, the leaders of al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, oh. the leaders of the Meiji Sunni, and, you, and this is a training ground for that with the same forces that would ultimately be built into what was a real capturing and, frankly, killing machine under Joint Special Operations Command with Stan McChrystal. And presumably you made, um, made friendships and relationships with other coalition... Uh, Very much so, and CIA, by the way, uh, mm. because the CIA was a big part of this war criminal hunt and the FBI, believe it or not, and we did... There's a very interesting lesson here that we probably should, I think we have relearned with the, uh, the detainees that we took to Guantanamo. Um, you have to approach this kind of operation as if it is going to be a law enforcement operation rather than a military operation. And that's very different. You have chain of custody, we would have an FBI special agent who would be with us. And we actually found, we took down four non-government organizations. Every six weeks we would take another one down that was supporting extremism in Bosnia. And in one of them, misnamed the Benevolence International Foundation, we found enough evidence to put that guy behind bars in uh, the United States. He happened to be in Chicago at that time, conveniently. Let me take you back a But few... you have to start with a law enforcement approach rather than an intelligence approach. If it's only intelligence, it's hard to turn that into evidence, as we have found with the trials at, at Guantanamo. Let me take you back um, 20 years before that, though, um, to the <coughs> occasion in 1991 where you uh, faced an extraordinary personal, um, uh, almost <laughs> a totally destructive moment uh, where coming. you were shot by an M16 yeah. rifle. Um, tell us about what it's like to be shot by an M16 rifle. <laughs> So uh, we did very aggressive live fire operations. It was really one of the hallmarks of the infantry battalion that I was privileged Where to Where were you at the time? I, uh, I was in the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, I would later command that division in combat. We'll I was the eighth to command the division in combat, in fact. Uh, standing next to me was the assistant division commander for operations, General Jack Keane, who later commanded the division Jack, as well, yeah. and, and was a big mentor of mine. Um, and an individual went into a bunker, sprayed it, threw a grenade, came out, and he was very, moving very rapidly, and he tripped on the top step, and as he came down, we think he tensed, and we think his finger was in the, inside the trigger housing, and he 
squeezed off around. And it went right through my chest. I've jokingly said that I dove in front of General Keene to take a bullet for him. He's <laughs> unpersuaded. Um, and it, what was interesting is that, you know, it's a very tiny little, it's only a 5.56 millimeter round. It's quite small. And I did validate the notion that you can actually take a round through the chest and still stand for a moment. Yeah. Then you go down. Uh, but the blow coming out was unbelievable. Uh, it just explodes out of your back, and it's a much bigger blow. And thankfully, it missed all of the, you know, it hit, it nicked an artery, nicked. Because if it severs an artery, you're, you're gone in less than a minute. We had two others that year alone, including another battalion commander and also a special forces sergeant first class who were killed uh, when they had an artery cut. So this is dangerous business, but you have to train for what you're going to do in combat. And then and, tell and, us about how you got out of hospital. Well, the, you know, so... This is wonderful battlefield realism for my medics, you know, they're pressed into action. Uh, the commander's <laughs> trying to die or whatever. Keen is holding my hand. They're getting IVs going. They get an air medevac in. They get me to the post hospital. And the key with a sucking chest wound is to get suction in it so that you don't suffocate on your own fluids. If you haven't died already, it didn't hit an artery uh, or sever an artery. Uh, so now the key is just to keep the person from suffocating on his own fluids. They did that in our military hospital. They really wanted to get major thoracic surgery though, so they put me on a helicopter and flew me down to Vanderbilt Medical Center, where conveniently my surgeon was a guy named Dr. Bill Frist, who would later be the Senate Majority Leader, as I used to say, I was dying to meet Senator Frist. <laughs> um, so uh, he did thoracic surgery and, and all the rest of that, but I was pretty anxious to get out. I was a brand new battalion commander. I felt I had a lot to prove. I had actually come from being the aide to the Chief of Staff of the Army, which, you know, they're all suspicious of this guy who was in the Pentagon, also who has, a, you know, the burden of a PhD and, and hanging out in the E-ring of the Pentagon. So. Um, I got impatient. I was, you know, walking laps uh, with the wheelchair with all the these tubes and everything else that are, because I had three chest tubes in. And finally, uh, around Friday, it was about five or six days. I said, "Look, you guys got to let me out of here." Uh, and I got down. I said, "How many push-ups do I need to do?" And so I think I did 50. It's the only time I've ever stopped at 50. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, well, I, so I they, do 50 so they every morning, out. you know, <laughs> of course, as well. Uh, and that's the point at which they finally let you out, the mm -hmm. 50 press-ups. Press yeah, makes sounds yep. good. Um, you mentioned the 101st, which you, as you say, had the honor to uh, command. And you had the honor to command it in 2003 on the March on Baghdad. Yep. Tell us about that. It was really an extraordinary operation. The, the, the unique aspect of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault, uh, it's no longer an airborne paratroop division. It had hundreds of people that were on jump status, including the commander, thankfully. but. It had 275 helicopters or so. It's literally more than most countries. Uh, we had three entire battalions of these heavy attack helicopters. You know, we used to jokingly say you could take down a small country with this division, and of course we did, or with a number of other forces. Uh, the logistics were the big challenge, um, and it is not easy to, you have to fly the helicopters to a port, you have to shrink wrap them, you break them down, you have to build them back up, you have to test fly them. This is all in dust. Uh, flying helicopters in very dusty conditions. You may remember the huge dust storm that shut us down. We literally deployed into the teeth of that dust storm and I, we were missing for two days 25 helicopters that we could not account for, all full of troops. Wow. So a little bit of anxiety there for the commander of the division for a period of time. And, the problem is we didn't have tactical satellite radios in those days. We didn't have all of the digital uh, devices and so forth that showed us on all of them. Some of them did. I remember in my own helicopter, uh, I had a two or three time Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter, Rick Atkinson, who, yeah. who's a fellow yeah. historian, great biographer. And my fear was that, you know, and we pressed on. We had to go because we thought we were going to do a big, deep attack that night with all of our Apaches. So I had to get to this command post that had been established. You know, the commander goes from one post that's established to the next one, and then, it, then he, that becomes the operative command post. And we're flying right into the, or fly, trying to fly away from the storm, but it's catching us. And my aide kept rubbing the window, and I said, Dave, you know, it's not inside, this is outside. Stop, because we get a reporter here and he's gonna capture all of this. 
And I thought, you know, we would go down, but the reporter would survive, and he would write about what, a, <laughs> what an insane commander Petraeus was. But we made it. We did. Um, but it was quite an experience because it was my first true combat. I mean, we had done these operations. I'd been in uh, Central America when there was counterinsurgency, but not directly involved. I did Haiti, as I mentioned. There was actually more kinetic stuff in Haiti than people think. But again, it wasn't the same as, you know, yeah, and dropping was, was 50 fists. bombs on a city before you take it in the morning exactly. uh, and getting fists shot back it. at. I mean, we had quite a bit of, uh, we were ambushed. A convoy that I was part of was ambushed. Uh, Sorry, above all things, a brigade sergeant major jumped out and killed the two guys that were in the ditch. Um, so it was pretty sporty. Um, and we also almost dropped a bomb on ourselves, not once, but twice. You know, certain missiles, they have to have a lock on a beam. Uh, and the dust was so high, we realized that the copperheads weren't flying to that beam. They were flying to where our command post was. So again, there were some interesting moments, um, I, I can, but it was I, real combat for the first time. And I'll never forget the call of the first battlefield loss that we had in the 101st Airborne Division. Your blood just goes cold. And then, and you never really do, I, I never found that I got hardened to casualties. Uh, they were always tough. Uh, in fact, I often used to say that a, a commander in particular, but anyone is like a vessel and bad news is poured in the top and it only drains so fast. And one of my jobs as a commander later on, especially as the four-star commander in the surge, was to identify subordinate commanders whose vessels were overflowing. Because in one, one or two cases, we literally moved an entire unit because it had been so beaten up in the first few months of the surge, taking five losses in each of three weeks consecutively. And we said, we, get, we have to get them out of there uh, and put another unit in. Their vessel is, is overflowing. And it was to Rick Atkinson that you said the famous words about how does this end? Yeah, I and forgot everything was on the record with a reporter. I mean, he's literally embedded with you. He's in the back of my Humvees, in the back of my helicopter. He's in my command post. But it was the key question, wasn't it? Well, it was the key question. I mean, we had been given a set of assumptions in Kuwait. Again, I'm just a two-star then. That sounds elevated, but I mean, there's lots of others above us. And there were two three-stars above us uh, and then a four-star. And I remember that the senior three-star gathered us all together before the actual uh, crossing of the berm into Iraq. And, they, you know, one more time we went through this whole thing. We'd done it already. I think, you know, there's a point in battle where, or before battle, where the senior guys just feel like they have to do something, so they gather you all in one more time. This is not trivial. You've got to fly in from the desert floor where you are with your units all coiled, ready to go. Anyway, at the end of the, the update, they also had the retired generals who were the head of the Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. And they said, any questions? I said, you know, excuse me, just could you give me just a little bit more detail about, you know, we get to Baghdad and we take down the regime and then what? And the three star who knew me, I'd worked for him before, uh, he said, Dave, you just get us to Baghdad. We'll take it from there. And, uh, you know, that didn't exactly materialize quite that way. Yeah, no. uh, I remember we actually took an intermediate city, Najaf, which is the holiest city in Shia Islam, and our soldiers were magnificent. And, and taking it down, if you will, without an, a single nick in the Gold Dome Mosque, again, the holiest location in all of Shia Islam. Uh, and I remember afterwards, and because I told our boss, I said, look, you know, you gave me the mission contain this city of 600,000 people so they won't get all over our supply lines. Um, and why don't I just take it and see what it's going to be like when we get to Baghdad? Uh, let's try this out in a city of 600,000 instead of a city of 7 million the first time. I remember calling him afterwards. Um, his call sign was Victory 6. Uh, I said, this is Eagle 6, the Screaming Eagles of the 101st. I've got good news and bad news. He said, well, what's the good news? I said, we own Najaf. What's the bad news? We own Najaf. What do we, what do, we do with it? He said, well, why don't you call those guys you know, from Orha? They said, you know, just let them know. And so I did. And we got, got through to them. They were still down in Kuwait getting organized. And we had a brigade stuck there for several weeks, actually. We could never really hand it off. And that was a huge challenge. And of course, then, tell me how this ends, uh, became you know, this, this question that in a way, haunted me forever until ultimately during the surge, I could actually, I actually I told Congress the way I hoped we would answer that question uh, with the surge, and we did. Uh, and, so, and so let's go into that. Um, 2005, you're at Fort Leavenworth, 
and you're right. Yeah, I'm the back actually 2006. So I, I did a two star tour. I got home. Rumsfeld sent me right out to do an assessment. I came back, gave me a set of recommendations. He said, these are great change command, go back over and implement them. So I spent another 15 and a half months there. So we spent it's, the first year, then yeah. that, and then I was back at it, Fort Leavenworth, it's Kansas. the writing of the manual, the counterinsurgency yeah, manual yeah. that I'm, I'm interested sure. in. Which, is, which fits in, obviously, with your being the intellectual soldier, as it were. I mean, this was, this was um, theory with a lot of, um, a lot of practice uh, built into it. Yeah, we needed an intellectual touchstone or foundation. Basically, we needed a, a good doctrinal manual. We did not have a current field manual on counterinsurgency. And here we are engaged in a counterinsurgency, and it's not going very well. We could see the trajectory of this, particularly during the year that we wrote this manual faster and published it faster than any other manual in history, um, because we just basically cut out everybody else that had to normally comment on it. The chief of staff of the Army empowered us. I remember I went to him when I came home from the three-star tour and en route to this location, which oversaw, it was called the engine of change for our army because you oversaw, I think it was 14 or 15 different training, training centers and bases, all the branches of the uh, army, the staff college, the doctrinal center, the leadership center, just on and on. It was a real, you had literally five or six different hats. And I asked the chief, I said, what do you, you know, you got any guidance for me? He said, yeah, Dave, shake up the army. Said, Chief, I can do that. Is, if that, you, Jim, is that Jim yes. Mattis you're talking about? No, this is uh, General Schoomaker. Jim Mattis uh, was a three star in the Marines. He was my co conspirator. Yeah. Because what we did is we made it an Army Marine Corps manual, not all military, because then it would have been joint and I would have lost control of it and the Pentagon would have snatched it and kept it in review for four or five years. So it never was, never has anything been published. It had a million downloads in the first month. We made it free. It had a full page, front page review in the New York Times, believe it or not. And some smart person then, you know, published it commercially with a little forward on it and made a bunch of money off it. But the bottom line was that this provided, again, the intellectual foundation for what it was that we needed to do. And it then, you know, within a couple of months of the publication, after having given an inscribed copy to every member of the Center Armed Services Committee and President Bush, you know, I end up over there commanding the surge in early February of 2007 through uh, mid-September 2008. And tell us more about the surge. How, uh, how well, the, did you manage to basically turn yeah. a, a, a war going one way into a war going very much another? Yeah, you have to keep in mind that the situation in Iraq uh, at the start of the surge was very, very desperate. We were on the verge of a full-blown Sunni-Shia civil war. Uh, the situation had deteriorated tremendously following a bombing in February of 2006, so about a year earlier, of a, of a holy Shia shrine in Samara that was in a Sunni area. And the agreement was always the Sunnis, even no matter how much they are at odds with the Shia, would always secure that shrine. It was north of Baghdad, and Shia would make pilgrimages to there after they'd done Najaf and Karbala, the two holiest cities. And it was blown up by Al-Qaeda. And this set off a cycle of sectarian violence that was horrific. And the result was that a strategy that had generally been doing reasonably well of training the Iraqi forces, gradually handing off to them, uh, over that year was invalidated because we continued to hand off to them. The violence kept growing. They kept not just absolutely uh, less combat effective, they were relative to the enemy completely combat and effective in most areas. And yet we pressed on because we got to get out of here and, and, and nobody wanted to reverse that until the surge. And so we've often noted that the surge that mattered most in Iraq was not the surge of forces, it was not the additional 25 to 30,000 troops that we ultimately got, as important as they were in accelerating the implementation of the surge. The surge was the big ideas where we reversed 180 degrees what we'd been doing. We went back into the neighborhoods. We took back over control of security from the Iraqi security forces. We actually had to take them out and reconstitute them in a formal process. They were so battered that you would take them to a training center, build them back up to 100%, train them up, all new leaders, all new equipment, vehicles, and then bring them back into the fight, having driven the violence down with our uh, young men and women in uniform, including, of course, a great coalition contribution uh, from the UK in the South. So, but there were other big ideas. Y you had to clear and hold, and before that we would clear and then hand off to the Iraqis and pull out and the violence would go up again. Um, you had to um, 
pursue the irreconcilables even more relentlessly, as I said. These are individuals they're never going to embrace. They're never going to sit down on the other side of the table. Uh, but then we also had to do reconciliation, which was not hugely popular uh, among our troops initially. And I knew it would not be, and that's why I asked Prime Minister Blair on my way to Iraq if he would leave uh, the deputy commander, Lieutenant General Sir Graham Lamb, who I knew from actually chasing war criminals in Bosnia when he was the director of special forces. Then we were division commanders together. He was the other guy in the room in the beginning when we were doing these really, frankly, just disastrous policy decisions, such as firing the Iraqi army without telling him what their future is, creating hundreds of thousands whose incentive was to oppose the new Iraq rather than to help it, and then compounding that by firing the Ba'ath Party. Yes, that was Saddam's party, and yes, we were proud to take down his two sons in Mosul when they refused to, to come out quietly. Um, and, and many levels down you should go, but not all the way to the bureaucrat level of tens of thousands who we needed to run the country and without, without an agreed reconciliation process. That was the real flaw. And Graham was the other guy that would raise his hand and say, excuse me, Ambassador, um, you know, we fired the military, we fired the Ba'ath Party, now you want to fire all the state-owned en enterprises. I mean, is anybody going to be left employed in Iraq? We got it that we want to have a thriving, prosperous, vibrant democracy and free market economy, but could we go this a little bit at a, at a time? So Graham was the deputy, and I, he had, and I had talked, he, and he was conspiring with Mattis and me. We were all in the same job uh, prior to him going back. He had talked to, to me about how he sat across the table from Patty McGinnis, I think it was, or somebody like that, who had, you know, as he put it, you know, a week ago he was swinging pipes at my lad in, in Belfast, and here I am reconciling, essentially, that, that, not that word, but talking to them, trying to, uh, and we needed to do that. We could not kill or capture our way out of an industrial strength insurgency. We ultimately reconciled with 103,000 Iraqis, started first with the Sunni insurgents, and their tribes, many of them were, were fairly eager to oppose al-Qaeda, which had turned out to be very abusive, as they typically are. You saw that repeated with the Islamic State. Initially, you welcome them because they're Sunni, and then you realize uh, you, they've long overstayed their welcome. That was huge to get them on our side, uh, but we had to secure them. You know, they're not going to do this unless they, and w the very first individual, the courageous sort of minor sheikh who started all of this, we parked two M1 tanks in his front yard, basically, of his compound. Tragically, he was killed a year later. In fact, when Ambassador Ryan Crocker and I were testifying uh, at the six-month mark in what was an incredibly emotional uh, set of hearings that we had to, had to endure. Yeah, you had, um, you had crowds outside shouting, betray us, and things like that. We had, I mean, the, the one that was interesting was it probably overplayed their hand and gave those handful that supported us something to, to complain about during the hearings, was that there was a full-page ad in the New York Times in the center so you open the Times, and this, these were the days when you still rifled through papers before you went up on the hill rather than doing it on the internet. And I was the one who had the Times, and I opened it, and it's a full page ad attacking me personally. This is not the policy. And, and that probably was a mistake on their part. I think it was moveon.org, and they got a cut rate, which was also found out. So <laughs> Rudy Giuliani, America's mayor still at that time, then took out a full page ad supporting me. But this is the kind of thing that we were you going to, through. And it was, you know, you'd have the pink ladies behind you. You would have, you know, up, up big interruptions in the hearings. People Sorry, would have pink, to be pink dragged ladies out. ladies in England is a kind of cocktail. What is it in America? Well, they wear pink and they have pink signs. Right. And, you know, they're obviously opposed to what it was that we were doing, whatever it um, uh, was. So let's, uh, it, let's it added to the drama and the emotion and, you know. Can we move on to Afghanistan or in sure. this case, in this case, uh, Pakistan? Um, of course, because I'd love to hear your, I know the audience would also love to hear your memories of the Bin Laden raid. Well, so we did the surge in Iraq, drove violence down by 85, 90%. It actually stayed down for three and a half years, so it really did succeed. And the tragedy was that when we withdrew our combat forces within 24 or 36 hours, this is many years later when I'm the CIA director. This is May uh, 2011. This is December of 2011. Um, Prime Minister Maliki of Iraq, who had been our partner during all of this, took highly sectarian actions that had the effect of just ripping apart the very fabric of society, particularly, again, between Sunni and Shia that we had worked so hard together to bring back together. Do you think the Obama administration could have done anything else and kept We could have kept troops? forces, I think. Uh, it would have been difficult because President Bush had, of course, agreed to withdraw them on that date. 
Uh, and so there would have been, but Prime Minister Maliki said he would sign a status of forces agreement, but he couldn't submit it to the parliament. He didn't feel he could get the council of representatives to support him. That we'd sort of, the policymakers had decided we really want to, even though we didn't have one. And by the way, we sent 5,000 back later on to combat ISIS without a parliamentary approved status of forces agreement. So yeah, I think it could have. The question, of course, is whether it would have been able to influence him to not do what he did. And that I'm somewhat questioned about. The, so I, I don't, I think it can be overstated that, well, the Obama administration pulled the troops and then it all fell apart. It fell apart because the prime minister tore it apart. Um, we would have had a much better platform for engaging the Islamic State. And my worry as the CIA director was that we were not able to keep all of the eyes and ears that we wanted to keep. And he wanted me to, Prime Minister Maliki and I negotiated with Secretary Clinton and the president's approval an agreement to keep certain assets there under my authorities rather than under, say, military authorities. And uh, ultimately, he never signed the document that would allow that to happen. So it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. Moving but you go over, to... and then I went to Central Command for yeah. about 19 months. Uh, and then when General McChrystal left Afghanistan, I, I, you know, I literally went to the White House for a meeting, literally a meeting, on that monthly meeting on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Got summoned up to the Oval Office. Everybody else is leaving while I'm going in. They're all avoiding eye contact. And you sit down with the president and nobody else in the room, which is very, very rare, except for the photographer, of course. He always has, it's always the photo op. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, but he took a couple shots of the two of us in those two chairs that are in the Oval Office. And the president turned to me and he said, I'm asking you as your president and commander in chief to take command of our forces and coalition forces in Afghanistan. And you know, the only answer to a question like that can be yes. So, uh, so we did that. That was a uh, little over a year. Um, and at the end of which, of course, then I was nominated to be confirmed to be the director of the CIA when Leon Panetta left to go to the Defense Department. Um, it was a fascinating year. And, and of course, it had some incredible achievements, highs, and everything else. Uh, it was the height of our forces, 150,000 coalition forces, 100,000 of those American. But in the final couple of months, of course, we had the operation that got bin Laden. And except that on that night, though that small unit, all well known from SEAL Team 6, um, and the commander of Joint Special Operations Command, by then Admiral Bill McRaven, who we literally were were together for four years in Iraq, Afghanistan, or, uh, Central Command, because you had Yemen as well, and then Afghanistan. Um, and that night, though, he worked for the director of the CIA, not for me, because it, we didn't have authorities in, beyond Afghanistan and because it was conducted under covert action authorities, which has some advantages if you don't want to talk about it. If it didn't go well, if there, if there were, or if it was aborted, we would just have not said anything about it, I think. But it had huge contingencies for the forces I was overseeing, you know, like all the F-16s were flying around in case those helicopters got intercepted. And uh, a fascinating night. Uh, we had a, a small Joint Special Operations Command liaison post. Again, I was dual-hatted as NATO and US. JSOC and uh, some of our special operations were only under the US line conducting counterterrorism operations, working very closely with the CIA. And I went into that that night late. Nobody else, I, I'd gone, but I said, I'm going to bed early tonight, guys. And then I snuck out in physical fitness gear and went over there. And went in and asked everyone to leave except for the senior individual who was a full colonel who had actually coincidentally been a lieutenant in my battalion in the 101st. It was his platoon that shot me. Uh, and um, <laughs> so there we were. Um, and it was an extraordinary <coughs> night, of course, because it, and that's where we monitored the operation. And again, I was not in the chain of command. I don't want you to, although I had, again, a lot of responsibilities if things turned south, because yeah. all the forces were ours by and large. Uh, but of course, the helicopter, lead helicopter, in a sense, crashes. It, it does a very abrupt landing. It settled. It's a different, it was a slightly different helicopter. The air is a little thinner, and it hit the roof. And it wasn't going to be, you couldn't, it was going to have to be destroyed, which meant you had to send in a huge Chinook helicopter, uh, which was the alert bird. We weren't sure. These other aircraft were, had some characteristics that made them more difficult to be identified. The Chinook did not. Um, and so now, and I literally was watching the Pakistani news feeds, because I'd been at Central Command and I knew how important these are. Yeah. 
uh, while we're actually, again, monitoring, observing what's going on with the operation. And of course, a lot of that's indoors, so you're only getting, and interestingly, it was done on a chat room. The, the JSOC operations largely were one because the chat function works really, really well, as opposed to point-to-point -point communications or even a, a, a conference call where people start to override one another. But of course, you get the Geronimo, 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 which means that the troops, at least, the special operators believe that they've got them. You bring them out, they destroy all the sensitive stuff in the one helicopter, they all load onto the, uh, the alert helicopter and fly him, his body back. Now, the irony is now the challenge, though, is that Je Admiral McRaven is the one who has to tell the President of the United States, it is bin Laden. And the problem is, of course, if you take somebody down like that, you know, you're going to get him in the, in the face. And he had a longer beard, it had gone white. And there was just a you know a tiny little bit of you know 0.001 percent that and McRaven and we couldn't do DNA that quickly. We did do DNA. It ultimately confirmed McRaven's assessment. So there was a moment where they laid out the body, and McRaven lay down next to him because they knew they were the same size. And he said, "Okay." Uh, so the president heard about this later, and of course the president has to go out and tell the country. And you know, and by the way, now there's a realization in Pakistan that. The helicopter that crashed was not a helicopter flying to the Pakistani military academy, which is only about two miles from, I spoke there. I flew right over bin Laden's house, I think, on final. Uh, but he's got to make that announcement. Um, and so later on, he has McRaven and a number of the operators to the Oval Office, and he had a plaque on it, and it had a tape measure. <laughs> and, you know, for Bill McRaven, next time, use a tape measure. Um, but what was interesting about that, I think, um, the real takeaway for me was always, okay, we got him. And I turned to the, you know, my former lieutenant, now full colonel, uh, who was a deputy commander of the Ranger Regiment, I think, at the time. And I said, Bill, you know, it was a really a privilege 20 some odd years ago to serve with you. And we'd been doing it, we'd been at war together for most of the previous 10 years. But we shook hands, and, and then we let everybody else in, and we dialed up the 12 to 15 operations that we were doing in Afghanistan. There was no huge you know, high five or the, even the metaphorical equivalent of spike in the football in the end zone. It was just OK. It's, another, it's an accomplishment, but we all knew it wasn't going to end the war on terror, and, and it certainly hasn't. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons, obviously, from the war on terror principle among them, that you have to keep an eye and pressure on groups like this wherever they are. And even if you can't conduct the kind of comprehensive civil military campaign that we were always seeking to do to, to remedy the, the root causes of this, at the very least, you have to periodically degrade and uh, disrupt what it is they're doing to prevent them from gaining the kind of capability that ISIS actually attained at one point when it was unleashing inspiring, motivating, guiding terrorist attacks in, in Western Europe. You went on to become <coughs> a director of the CIA. Um, had your, you must have had a great deal of interaction with the CIA <coughs> over your entire career, really. Um, well, especially at the, you know, during these war years, you always had, I remember, of course, I mentioned I was very close to the station chief and deputy station chief in uh, Sarajevo. In fact, the deputy station chief had been an airborne lieutenant with me in our first unit, West Point graduate, airborne ranger. Um, and that just continued. Uh, the, one of the really legendary figures uh, in, it's publicly known because he ultimately had a position, Greg Vogel, who earned the Medal of Honor equivalent for saving Karzai's life going into Afghanistan and quite a sporty uh, endeavor. Uh, he, <laughs> he literally, he, at the Battle of Najaf, this very first fight that we have, we set the conditions for two days, all the brigades are positioned around it. We put 40 or 50 precision munitions into the city at two or three in the morning. Uh, we have, you know, there's helicopters over the shoulders of the soldiers. There's bigger ones back here. There's close air support. There's artillery, mortars. Everything is set. And we're just about to go. And here comes this guy in a pickup truck. Uh, he's got a baseball cap on backwards. Uh, and he's sitting behind a huge dual anti-aircraft cannon that's been welded into the back of the pickup truck, and this was my CIA liaison. And he says, hey, chief, you know, how we doing? Ready to go? Uh, and, and so this was a legendary individual who was subsequently, I can't tell where it was, but he, had, he was a station chief in, in several locations 
just in the period that I was in these different uh, positions. So if you're the theater commander as a central command, again, you're working very closely with them in those countries, particularly where you are at war. And you had, what was interesting was that the agency in Baghdad agreed fairly early on that they would show me what they were going to put in the presidential's daily brief the next day because I had a fair amount of expertise. I mean, by then I'd been there for three or three and a half years, and longer than any of them. I knew the, the prime minister, the ministers. I literally could identify their sources by, you know, I'd say, oh, I see you talked to the minister of such and such yesterday. I'd say, Can, cannot confirm or deny. But I broke with the agency. Uh, on a major national intelligence uh, estimate, NIE, uh, at the six-month mark of the surge. And uh, there was a reason I explained to the president, you know, look, I just submitted mine today. They had to lock their books down six weeks ago, and the trend continued. So it truly is not, it is truly different. And I don't just have a footnote or a annex. I break with the conclusion of a national intelligence estimate. Literally, the DN, director of national intelligence was out in my office the next day saying, we have to figure out how we can avoid that uh, in the future. Uh, he understood why it happened. And, and in fact, when I was the CIA director, he was still the DNI. We shortened that very dramatically for dynamic situations. That was the problem in this case. But they realized, you know, we probably ought to show this guy what it is we're going to say about the theater of war that he's commanding. Uh, and, and I understood that I could not direct them to change it. Um, but I could offer uh, something with it. It, it very it seldom happened, actually. Um, we, uh, <coughs> you've publicly um, uh, broken with the, uh, or, or uh, I'm trying to think of a word less, less grand than denounced, but maybe denounced would even be okay. With, Questioned. Um, question. There Questioned you go. seriously. Yes. Questioned and seriously repeatedly. and repeatedly and deeply and profoundly. Um, but not denounced, um, President Biden's decision to withdraw American, well, uh, essentially coalition forces from Afghanistan. Tell us about your, um, about your reasoning. Well, the challenge with Afghanistan, and when I, I also forgot to say, I also had to do an assessment for Secretary Rumsfeld in Afghanistan one time as well, coming home from the three-star tour. And I remember the first slide in that briefing was titled, Afghanistan Does Not Equal Iraq, and it laid out all the factors by which you could compare, and they were really quite profound differences. The biggest and most formidable, of course, is that the enemy headquarters are outside Afghanistan. The, as I used to remind my Pakistani partners, there's a reason the Taliban leadership is called the Quetta Shura. It's located outside Quetta, the capital of Baluchistan, one of your provinces, and you guys won't do anything about it. Uh, there's a reason that the other shura is called the Peshawar shura. It's because, again, that's where they are located. And this is a massive disadvantage. So you can never really truly go to the source. Every now and then we would get some authority or other organizations, other uh, government agencies, as they say, would be able to do something there. But not sufficiently enough for us to really put pressure on them. Beyond that, then they had no money. It's a huge country much bigger than Iraq, very limited infrastructure by comparison, highly illiterate, very little economic activity. And so again, the, the challenges there are very, very much more formidable than they were in Iraq, even though Iraq's level of violence was sky high compared to Afghanistan's even in the worst times. So what you had to do eventually is acknowledge we are not going to be able to win in Afghanistan. What we can do is we can manage and you assess, okay, look, this government is imperfect, uh, it's flawed, it's maddening, it's frustrating, and the same was true when President Karzai was there as well, and you know, we had a, a good relationship, but boy, there were times when you know, it was just uh, very, very challenging. I literally had to, I had to threaten to quit uh, one time over something with him, and he then uh, clarified what it was he said right before the big summit meeting at which we were going to extend our mandate, but in this case, you have these challenges, and, that, and you therefore just have to accept what is going to be a very unsatisfactory situation. And the question is, should you commit the resources needed to maintain an unsatisfactory condition or take your chances with what could follow? My sense was that what would follow, which has actually transpired, would be disastrous, uh, heartbreaking, um, tragic. Uh, you know, I don't see how you can compare, however flawed that government was, 
uh, with Taliban ruling a country and trying to take it back to a 7th century interpretation of Islam again. Uh, and we are seeing the kind of, you know, capricious summary justice, women, you know, need not come back to work, uh, girls can't go to school. My wife and I have, have a scholarship that we've funded a woman at the American University of Afghanistan. She's now in Qatar studying, thankfully, but again, we don't see the prospect uh, of American University certainly continuing. In fact, uh, the Haqqani network was occupying half of it. And so the prospect for Afghanistan now is going to be very, very bleak indeed. Um, it is going to see increasing violence. The Taliban are already discovering it's a lot harder to be a counterinsurgent and to defend and to provide basic services and to maintain security and to run an economy than it is to be a bunch of insurgents and terrorists where you just sort of hang out in the valleys or the mountains and then come down and attack people periodically uh, and so forth. Um, by the way, they did do a masterful campaign. And when I, I did predict, I said publicly that I fear, I said I feared a, a uh, psychological collapse of the Afghan security forces. Um, there's no alternative to having the kind, roughly the kind of concept we had for those forces. I mean, those who say, well, we should have made them more like insurgents. I mean, they're not insurgents. They, are, they have to defend populated areas and critical infrastructure. So they can't do what insurgents do. Uh, they actually have to defend. And so what you do is you have sort of basic soldiers, uh, maybe 100,000 or so of the army. This 300,000 number is the entire everything, including police, border forces, customs. So you have maybe 100,000 that are actually defending these areas. Um, and then when they're hit, you r respond with the air mobility uh, of helicopters, close air support, attack helicopters, all of which we provided. Uh, and you have about 30 or 40,000 in reserve, who are, many of whom are really quite good. They're the commandos. They were trained by special operations, very well equipped. And that worked quite well until we withdrew our contractors. And I had advised against providing American helicopters. They're just very, very, they're very, very capable, incredibly capable, but they're very sophisticated. And it's the difference almost between analog and digital. And the Russian or Soviet equipment that we were getting when I was still the commander, they could operate that. They knew that from the old days. Uh, it was much easier. But we had 18,000 contractors maintaining uh, the many dozens of helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft, attack helicopters, and so forth. Uh, and that proved to be the Achilles heel. Once the soldiers on the front lines, once the Taliban hit them in multiple places simultaneously and there was not a response with reinforcements, the troops realized there's nobody coming to the rescue, there's no close air support, there's no air medevac, there's no emergency resupply, and, a, and there's no commandos. Why do you continue to fight? Especially if the local political guys who are getting text messages from the Taliban, very skillful use of social media and so forth, are realizing, okay, I, you know, again, they're in these kinds of situations, populations become somewhat professional chameleons. They try to figure out who's going to win, uh, and then ultimately, if it's pretty clear, uh, they're going to look like that one. And that is, is what they have done. It's not to deny that in some of the rural areas, which are more, much more conservative, that there's not actually a slight affinity for the Taliban. And we should recognize we made tons of mistakes along the way. And at various times, we violated that most important question, which is, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it uh, creates by its operation? Uh, and if the answer to that is no, then you're supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes. But we, we literally had that sign on the wall of my operations posts from when I was a two-star general and every single command in combat uh, after that. Right, we're going to ask, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the, in the um, audience, uh, could you put your hand up, please, and uh, if you've got a question. And uh, there's a question here from the um, lady in the very fetching um, dress here in the front row. Um, and, uh, and she's going to start Thank off. you for your service. That was a privilege. And um, so much of your recipe for success uh, relied upon the interagency communication. Big time. It had to be a comprehensive civil military campaign. And the information on the ground. Yes. We think we read that there's no longer that recipe in place. Can you comment on that? Sure, it's going to be very, very difficult. Keep in mind that Afghanistan was not just the platform for operations against the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and uh, the insurgents in Afghanistan. 
It was also the platform for the so-called regional campaign, which, of course, uh, included various actions, according to the New York Times, at least, because they might have been by the CIA, uh, that took place in Western Pakistan and, and maybe one in Baluchistan over the years, this kind of thing. So, and it was a very elaborate set of bases and posts and everything else, and there were very substantial surrogate forces that were very, very useful. By the way, the one organization that did get its people out was the CIA. It very quietly assembled them at a base that was very near the airport. Of course, the CIA has its own entry into the airport, which is normally locked. They also have helicopters, and they either put them in through the secret entrance or they flew them in directly and, and got out the bulk of those that were viewed as being most likely to be in harm's way. But no, the, the challenge now is going to be enormous. And uh, you know we are literally probably going to have to determine um, can we give, you know, should we actually give intelligence maybe through the Pakistanis to the Taliban if uh, we know where these guys are? But keep in mind that with no bases there, your drones in particular, which are the unblinking eye, and it's not just getting full motion video, it's getting lots of other uh, kinds of intelligence based on what plaque packages you have on a drone, they will spend 60% of their time just flying to and from Afghanistan uh, from bases in Qatar or the UAE. Uh, you can park an aircraft carrier off the coast of southwestern Pakistan. We, we have. We did during the uh, evacuation. But that's an incredibly costly commitment uh, and, and fly stuff off there. So the fixed-wing aircraft that we have are all refuelable. It's going to be a long time in the cockpit for the people, and you have to have a very elaborate refueling structure above all of this. Um, but the drones right now, by and large, are not refuelable. So you have a, a limit. They're very long in, endurance. I mean, could be 24 or more hours, depending on what you're hanging off it, uh, including ordnance. Uh, but you're going to use a huge amount of that time just getting to and from, as opposed to the unblinking eye in an orbit over an in area of interest. The other problem is that without something on the ground to tell you what you're seeing, you, you're looking at this. This happened to me on the night of the Benghazi attack. Um, we had a drone was repositioned. I think it was a military drone, but I, I'm not positive. And so I had a feed. Believe it or not, in my house, actually, um, we, there's a whole secure compartment intelligence facility that took up half of our little gym. Uh, but in that, I could pull down the feeds of, uh, of a drone, and I did, and I was literally watching. But because there was nobody narrating, um, and we didn't actually have somebody on the ground that had a downlink, and it had actually been back over Tripoli, and we, it was flown over, which gives, you know, it sort of shows the challenge of understanding what you're seeing. Basically, you're seeing guys with guns. Are they our guys or those guys? By the way, some of them actually did change sides in the middle of the night in Benghazi and all this stuff. So this is going to be hugely challenging. And they'll have to establish new networks, new tradecraft, new ways of, of communicating, new this and that. And the Islamic State has been, its ranks have been swollen dramatically by all the jailbreaks that the Taliban did en route to Kabul. Uh, it is conducted several dozen attacks just in recent weeks, including two very, very high-profile bombings of Shia mosques during Friday periods. And now you see the resistance starting to galvanize. Uh, they're regrouping just in the way that the Taliban did. It took the Taliban years to reconnect in, in Pakistan after they were shattered in Afghanistan and fled the country, but eventually came back in. You're seeing the resistance doing the same thing, mostly in the north, to be sure, because that's where the ethnic and sectarian groups are that are generally uh, opposed to the Pashtu, who are the core of the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani. One last item, there is a bit of a tug of war going on between the two main elements of the so-called Taliban, the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani Taliban. Haqqani sort of has the upper hand right now. They were always the, the most dangerous to us as well. They're the ones who are always trying to bomb Kabul. Um, and in fact, the leader of the Afghan Taliban has retreated down to Kandahar. Uh, and that could actually manifest itself in, in, I don't know about some internecine warfare at the very least. So the prospects, and again, the economy has collapsed. We used to provide 75% of the budget uh, for them. That's not forthcoming. Their assets are frozen around the world because no one wants to give this organization the billions of dollars that are sitting in New York and other places. The World Bank and IMF privileges are on hold. Um, and it was a terrible drought. It was the worst 
harvest in 35 years in Afghanistan this summer. So even those who normally would have otherwise had at least their own agricultural products uh, are in a very sad situation. Um, those that could, you know, had the means and had the passports and all the rest of that fled long ago. Uh, others fled, of course, during that extraordinary evacuation. Uh, but there are still many, many tens of thousands, if not more, of individuals to whom we have a moral obligation that qualified, for example, in the U.S. for the special immigrant visa and their family members um, by serving two years on the ground as a battlefield interpreter with our forces. You know, our son was a rifle platoon leader and then a, a ranger over there. Um, he always had an interpreter with him. These guys did multiple tours. Uh, they got attacked multiple times, and we owe them, and we still need to get them out. Uh, and there's a group called No One Left Behind that I support that does uh, is trying to help with that. Next question, Zudi to Gabrionis. Um, thank you very much. Um, as being half Ethiopian, I'm deeply concerned about the Tigray civil war going on in, in northern Ethiopia. Yes, yep. And I wonder, um, given your significant military command experience, what your view is on what the West should do. Because um, especially in light of the recent airstrikes um, by the Ethiopian central government on, on Tigray. Yeah. I mean, you have this ironic situation where the president, the elected president of the country, who in a sense reconciled, previously, of course, uh, earned the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and now is carrying out a pretty pretty harsh, pretty brutal campaign, noting that there's two sides fighting in this in the Tigray. And I should just note, as a partner in an investment firm, we owned the largest rose grower in uh, Ethiopia. So there's a degree of knowledge of what was going on on the ground. We exited it several years ago. It was, it was successful. But Ethiopia was arguably the last country of the four big countries in Africa where you had really propitious investment opportunities. Uh, Nigeria obviously has challenges, South Africa has huge challenges, and Kenya uh, has a number as well. Got a number. Uh, and, it, and, it, and sadly, tragically, uh, obviously this has just really spiraled downward into essentially a, you know, an ethnic civil war. Um, and to, to halt that descent, I mean, there are, we have very good diplomats. I, I believe it's Ambassador Feltman is one of them in this situation um, who are trying to get people to draw back from the abyss. But one, once this starts, that cycle of violence is very, very hard to break. This is what we had to break, for example, in the surge in Iraq. In Iraq, what we did was we put our forces between, right at the fault lines between Sunni and Shia. And that was the only way. And then you clear that side, and then you clear this side, you control it. Gated communities, we used to... We used to say you could pay a lot of money in Miami to get a gated community. We're providing them for free for you in, in Baghdad <laughs> with big concrete walls. Uh, I don't know how you do that in this case. And again, uh, the, the leaders of either of the warring factions here are certainly not, not listening, shall we say. We've got a, uh, a time for one more yep. question. Sure. Uh, uh, this gentleman here in the, uh, the centre wearing the grey um, gray jumper. John Royal Petraeus, I was listening to one of the earlier columnists who wrote in a previous column a few weeks ago that Afghanistan should be the last failed neo-colonial experiment. What's your view on America being the world policeman? Is there still that role? How should America play that role going forward? Well, I think that there is no substitute for American leadership. Um, I think I strongly agree with this administration. Look, I broadly support this administration's foreign policy the most important element of which is to work together with all of our allies and partners in contrast with the previous administration, which worked with some but not obviously with all, uh, work with all of them uh, to develop the most important policy in the world, which is a coherent, comprehensive whole of governments, again, all of the elements of not just our interagency but yours and everyone else's, for, for China. Uh, the, again, if you think of the United States as the guy in the circus who has to get plates on sticks and gets them all spinning. The U.S. has to keep more plates spinning than any other country in the world, and there is no substitute for that. Um, I am always um, slightly bemused when I hear of European security initiatives. And look, we all in the United States and North America, Canada too, would love to see Europe take on more of its own uh, national security and defense uh, efforts. Keep in mind the reality, though, is that the U.S. doesn't just spend more than all of its 29 NATO allies put together. It spends more than twice as much as all of them put together. Uh, and so there, it, there is no substitute, again, for U.S. leadership uh, in a variety of different ways. 
And so that's why, again, I think, uh, and I also I believe in the values, the principles, the freedoms. Uh, and again, this administration, you know, the counts of democracies that they're going to gather, went back to the Climate Accord, back to WHO uh, and all the rest. Uh, Afghanistan's an outlier, but all the others we are very much maintaining, but doing it in a sustained, sustainable, being measured in blood and treasure. And to really get to your question, what you're really getting at is the, the prudence that is needed, the thoughtfulness that's needed in uh, these endeavors. Um, I'm not one who thinks that Afghanistan went wrong when nation building was started. If you don't do nation building, to whom do you give the tasks that you're performing? I mean, you have to do this again. It's a little bit like saying that, the again, the military should have been insurgents. They're not insurgents, and they have to train them as counterinsurgents. But the U.S. does have to play that role, I believe. It does have to play it, especially with its kindred spirits. And, and, and the U.K. is foremost among those in that regard. Uh, and so that would be the approach. Uh, you know, should you be very, very cautious? Absolutely. The death of General Colin Powell, of course, a truly great American um, and Powell's rules, that really emphasized that kind of prudence and how ironic, tragically, it, as he put it, that he had that blot of being the front person uh, for the invasion of Iraq based on intelligence that proved faulty. But I, so again, I, that's sort of the essence of the special relationship, frankly, in many ways. And maybe it's a good note to end on because I forgot to say up front how privileged I feel to be on an actual stage with you, having done, I think, this at least this many virtual, <laughs> just for the New York Historical Society alone, we're mining the Churchill book endlessly. Uh, and but can then, I point then out with that all David of you, has and, and, come here without a book to sell. Yeah, wow. even better. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, General Dan David Petraeus. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Great. Thanks.